Hey, Christy Brown, how are you? Hey, Alan, I'm great. How are you? Great. You're in the you're uh, in the great city of Atlanta, and I'm down here in Tampa Bay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Right. And uh, I appreciate you coming on my little my little show. Uh, this is only a few months old, but uh, I'm already off and running with really great guests, and uh, and now I have another one. I keep just level. I seem like I just keep leveling up every every week. So thank you again <laughs> for for coming on. Such a pleasure. Absolutely happy to be here. You and I met. It was kind of cool how you and I met. Um, you know, I, I'm in Tampa Bay and you were, uh, of course, always inv investing and looking at new companies to invest in. And you were making your tour and uh, through Tampa Bay and uh, you reached out and wanted to know who were the companies that you could look at. And the Tampa Bay Wave, as we know, is a, a leading accelerator in Tampa and beyond. And we lined up a good number of companies for you to uh, I think you did some speed dating, uh, did, if I'm not if I remember correctly, right? I would absolutely call it speed dating. Yeah, I've, I've gotten accustomed to that when I'm uh, meeting with companies that are interesting to to perhaps do seed to series investing. And in. it's just like 20 minutes, you can get in and out and kind of decide if, if uh, they like you and you like them. And there's in some of those I still keep in touch with. I mean, I have one out of um, out of Tampa Bay that you introduced me to that's going to sit on a panel for me in, in July, actually, here in Atlanta to talk about uh, educational technology and the advancements in that space. So excited about that. Tampa definitely has a, a massive startup ecosystem. It's a city that uh, I continue to look at, even with Launchpad 2X and our advancement into uh, new spaces. It isn't that the, the, the one of the uh, un, uh, one of the things that's not fully known by entrepreneurs uh, you know, starting out first time, especially is the um, relationship building that goes into raising capital. You know, you don't get a check on to, you know one meeting and, and, and often it takes months, if not years, really, to get that relationship to the point where someone will actually write a check and invest. Uh, I think many founders just don't fully understand that and that they have to get started early and go to those meetings, go to those speed dating, uh, go, you know, engagements and then um, then play a long game. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's crucial. You know, we talk about it a lot. There, there are companies that consistently stay in touch, whether, you know, I'm actively investing or investing for other people or what have you, just so that we can utilize my network and find people that would be more suitable for them than I, right? So I'm, I, I say it all the time, you know, I, I don't have to be super smart to look at, you know, seed or angel investing. Um, I don't think that we are super smart. I think right. that we look for growth strategies in that in that marketplace. And and so I say that to say that I talk to founders all the time and tell them, you know, this is this is about you. It's not about your business sometimes. And so it's it's good to be out in front and know that two years down the road, if you've got a, a great relationship with someone that's that's been doing investments, that they have a network of you know a, a huge network effect of of others that they'll be willing to introduce you to because you've you've fostered and grown that and, you know, been a suitable candidate to, to keep in touch. I, I especially love receiving, I shouldn't say this because I'll probably receive a thousand now, but I love getting the um, monthly updates from companies that I've touched or interacted with because it really defines their progress and it makes me so excited for them. Um, you know, me being a, a founder with exits as well. It makes me genuinely thrilled to see some advancements or even some of the, you know, some of the kind of vulnerable truths that they tell um, on their updates that, that they're having pains with, especially right now during a, a healthcare crisis. You can help them possibly with, right? Yeah. And that's, this is something that, that uh, it's so great you just said that uh, because it's it's a good message to get out there because it's actually, it's kind of counter, uh, it's against the grain a little bit for an early struggling entrepreneur to take the time to do it um, to do spend time on anything that isn't going to like, uh, doesn't have a 30 day ROI on it. Right. It's really hard. Uh, right. You know, cause you're trying to get yeah. a sale, you're trying to get an investor and you, especially once you're out there, um, and you've made the, the leap and, to, and that just doesn't work very well when it comes to, especially with in, investors and, and also this idea of keeping them in the loop. Uh, it's, it's, it takes an extra, I think it takes an extra amount of discipline on the founder's part and the company's part to actually, to do it, knowing that, it's a long, it's a longer ROI for doing, for doing it. Yeah. Look, I mean, you could, you could compare that to what corporations do every month in closing their books and presenting in front of their 
senior leaders to say, this is how we performed. It's, it's a very similar thing. And when you're asking for somebody's money, which is already certainly personal, um, whether it's venture capital or not, you've got LPs in your fund that you're reporting to, uh, then it's sensible to, to think as a founder that I should message these folks, you know, whether or not they feel like the right investor. Again, it's, it's yeah. how you communicate. Communication's everything, I think, as you're fundraising. Yeah, and, and just that's a great and point. growing and growing Absolutely. your company, of course. Yeah, yeah not just fundraising, but growing in general. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say about that is it's not even it's not even necessarily to your point earlier. It's not even necessarily that person that may or may not write a check. It's if they have a great warm feeling about you or what you're doing, mm -hmm. they're likely to introduce or connect you to someone that maybe will. Right? It's a network yeah. effect and. People, founders, early stage entrepreneurs forget that as well. They, they think very one to one, very short term, because uh, they're obviously under duress. So it's really hard to 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 um, to have that bigger thinking. But the ones that do win, the ones that do win, yeah. and a lot of times the ones that get the funding, people are like, "How did they get that? How did they get that money? How did they get that big investment?" That's this is the stuff we're talking about is usually the reason behind it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and, you know, as well as I do, Alan, so I don't have to kind of repeat it, but, you know, there's a there's an eight and 10 failure rate in venture capital as well. So even if you're looking at another you know, business or founder that that got the funding and you didn't, you could be in it for a, a totally different uh, longevity than, you know, that founder could have been. And sometimes it especially in early stage investing, you're looking at uh, you're looking at that person and the quality of their right, team right, right. and so right. on and so forth. Yeah. So um, I got a question for you. Um, I have a little. I have an answer. Of, yeah, <laughs> I have a bit of a, I have a bit of a uh, of a tradition um, where I throw up a slide, an opening slide mm -hmm. to um, um, to kind of uh, throw throw off my uh, my guest a little bit um, and get them to answer a question right off the top that uh, that that I know that they have an opinion on. Um, and so this is one I came up with for you. Uh, it's called it's called how many mentors does an entrepreneur need. Mm -hmm. OK, and uh, and and because you gave me when so you came and spoke, you came and spoke to my uh, my entrepreneurship class at University of South Florida last year. And you said something in, in that talk that uh, really stuck with me around mentors. And not only do not only do you have an answer for this question, but you had this other um, this other extra dimension that you're probably going to share when it comes to mentors. So why don't we uh, start with the uh, the face value uh, answer to this question? Yeah. So it's it's funny that I knew this would come back to me once <laughs> I shared this with your class. Uh, I am a I'm a fan of always identifying mentors and those that can lead in front of me. Right. That I that I can learn from. Um, I oftentimes say I didn't, you know, kind of step into I, I didn't walk into venture capital and think, oh, I'm going to be a venture capitalist, nor do I think I am. I just accidentally do things. Um, and I think my businesses have been that way as well. But it's also been incited by me having mentors in front of me kind of pushing and accelerating and saying, you can do this. Let's, you know, let's create some guardrails. But I also have this philosophy that you don't stick with the same mentor year after year, that you you have to evolve that um, and you have to change and your mentors change with you. And there are actually some folks, I would say, in my kind of my 360 degree circle right now that I four years ago would not have been the individuals that I lean on now, but I do lean on now, um, you know, or, or I wouldn't have leaned on, sorry, earlier that I do lean on now. And, um, and it's kind of sense and sensibility, right? They've got some, some skill sets that I need some help and probably loving, loving tender care around. And I also have something that they're willing to, to kind of look at um, and be part of, around, you know, hoisting female founders. So, so I lean into those mentors uh, a good bit. And, you know, my husband challenged me recently and said, you're too, you're too old to have a mentor. Don't you think you're the mentor? And I do, I mentor a lot. I'm, I'm, I do, that's part of my DNA, but, but on the flip side, what I, I guess I shouldn't term them as mentors as much as kind of the, the guiding light in front of me. And, and I do tend to all that every 12, you know, I'd say 12 to 14 months. I think I used to have this timeline in my head that it was 18 months that I would stick with a kind of a person that would evolve. But, you know, it's it's like a relationship, right? You're you're going to mature in that and, you know, find different calibers of, of levers that you pull and, you know, all kinds of things. So, so I've kind of got this 12 to 14 month model in my head now. 
Yeah, you kind of blew my mind when you said that and you shared that with the class and I was asking about it afterwards and it was just, I never heard anybody say that, you know, you purposely trade in your, your mentor every about 88, every 18 months. Now you did say you, you transferred them into being a friend. Yes, <laughs> convert, I tend to do that a lot. Yeah. You convert your mm -hmm. mentor to a friend, you know, and then you find a fresh new mentor. Um, a, a lot of it was because uh, at some point a mentor relationship does become so close mm -hmm. and familiar over a year or two that it, it's hard for them to actually um, give you the the direct uh, objective feedback that you need, right? It because almost becomes too much of a friendship, right? Yeah, and I would also say, you know, it, it's a hardcore book to read, but you know, the art of war really defines that, and you know, kind of the mission critical. At some point, the student outshines the master, and that does really do, you know, that does really happen. I have, you know, founders all the time that I've worked with for for a couple of months, and they're just so brilliantly uh, intelligent that, you know, they get it. They don't need me any, anymore. And and that's okay. I mean, that that's exactly what, you know, you kind of want for, for those people is to accelerate and accelerate quickly. Um, but that happens, you know, it's, it's the student outshines the master at some point and then you're looking or you're craving if you're a learner and I'm an avid learner, like you're, you're craving every day that, you know, you go find the next thing to learn or, or grow or instill in yourself. Uh -huh. I think that was just some fantastic advice. So I appreciate you. Uh, you <laughs> but I knew that. that would bite me. I, I was wondering <laughs> if you would go back to that. <laughs> I was like, I always, when I do this, I, I have to keep it fun for myself, right? I, you know, yeah. I do pre-call pre interviews with everybody and we work out kind of what we're going to talk about generally, but I'm like, I'd still need a little element of surprise in this too. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would, I, yeah, so that's that. So let me, um, if I could just quickly cover our, our sponsors. So our sponsor on this particular episodes, a group, a company called Executive Launch, and it's uh, execlaunch.com. And it's a group that really focuses on helping current executives in middle middle to large companies um, put their, their plan and resources together to create their startup, create their exit. And, um, and so the, you know, the funny thing about senior executives and companies, they've never been used to being in a resource poor environment. Um, and, uh, and, and all of the risk and, uh, and struggles of being in a startup, but they, a lot of them would love to do it and have the relationships and the contacts and the experience, you know, the experience of leadership, have so many of the things needed. I mean, they've proven themselves obviously in corporate executive leadership, but the startup game is a whole different game. And, um, so this is a group that helps, uh, helps executives, uh, make that happen. Okay. So Fantastic, and that that uh, and that 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 parallels uh, your your story here. When we get into your story, Christy, you've got some of this executive launch stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so what I want to do is um, come back to this, and and I want to just quickly read your bio. Um, sure. we'll make it brief. So so currently, uh, Christy is currently the uh, president of an organization called Launchpad Two uh, X. So Launchpad. 2X is a nonprofit training organization for women and has dedicated, um, they're dedicated to changing the instinctual tendencies in women and replacing them with the skills needed to be impactful in their role as CEO, founder, um, and secure the funding they need to grow their company. So you're getting right at the heart of some of the, the things that women, especially women founders struggle, you know, struggle with, in my opinion, not of their own fault. Like a lot of this is societal, a lot of it's uh, structural, yeah. right? Um, so I think that's fantastic. Let's launch pad 2x. You're also a strategic advisor for tone networks. You're a venture partner with Republic. Um, and also you're a mentor with, uh, uh, tech stars and tech stars for those watching will know that's one of the largest organizations in the world for, um, for, for mentoring, um, startups and you're, you're a mentor with them. Um, and then also I wanted to read, um, so this is the cool part. So, so you didn't actually write it your bio this way, but I happen to know that you're a four, you've, you've exited, uh, at least four times and, and for us in the startup game, three, the three okay. Three, three, three times. I think for us in the startup game know that, uh, that, that means that there was a, there was usually a pretty nice payday associated with that. Um, and that's a lot of, for, for, you know, you know, the money is not necessarily the ultimate, always the goal. And entrepreneurship, uh, freedom is important. Building something great is important. And, and, and all the great things you get to do with entrepreneurship, but to get the coveted exit um, mm -hmm. is definitely important. And it actually lets you refuel and recharge to do it again, right? That's what's nice about <laughs> yeah. it, right? Yeah. 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 
but you've done that three times. And so you're a repetitive serial entrepreneur with more than 17 years of experience as a seasoned executive leading. You did a big corporate. We're going to talk about corporate yep. turnaround. Mm-hmm. A lot of your, a lot of your interesting, how you went back and forth between big corporate to startup and corporate to startup. Uh, it's a playbook that I think a lot of people should know because what's neat about that, if you've got somebody, if you play that game just right, you've almost always got somebody who wants to buy you, which. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which investors yeah. like too. Investors yeah. like that too. By the way, yeah. uh, you're recognized for catalyzing culture innovation, ideating creative business solutions, and demonstrates ongoing natural aptitude for organizational improvement and advances. Um, as a business whisperer, uh, I want to hear more about that later. Um, <laughs> uh, business whisperer, uh, maybe you could say you're a founder, was an entrepreneur whisperer, business whisperer. She oftentimes identifies where businesses are dislocated and works to identify the people, processes, and advances needed to develop a growth strategy or have frank and difficult conversations about the business's future. So, yeah. um, and you speak on topics around emerging technologies and your personal topic of corporate entrepreneurship um, and that business whisperer thing again. So. Uh, let's let's get that right out of the table. What's yeah. the business whisperer all about? Yeah, I think you kind of captured that, and that's that's interesting because no one uses that that term with me anymore, and so I had to actually let that sit because um, I I forget <laughs> how much I talk your, about uh, that. Your, your, you haven't updated all your PR lately, have you? <laughs> no, no, it's still so such a value. You know, it really is sitting down with. Um, so you know, part of my DNA is is startup. It's entrepreneurship. It is hardcore entrepreneurship. It's building, you know, whether I'm sitting, and I use this story a lot. My first company, I sat in the middle of my, you know, living room floor. I had a bunch of papers. I knew that I had to get clients. I had to pay bills, you know, and I did all that on my own. I had to just launch and, you know, and have immediate revenue. There was no, I, I never thought about it any other way, but I have to have a client that pays me. So, you know, so when I think about, you know, kind of the business whisperer, I've, I've really worked, you know, you captured that earlier. I've crossed a lot of different um, geography in corporate. I've crossed a lot of different geography in consulting, and I've crossed a lot of different geography in entrepreneurship and now, you know, venture capital and accelerating companies. Um, you know, it's, it's really that acumen to sit down and have those very frank, direct conversations, no matter what it is, corporate, entrepreneurship, what have you, to say your business has a real problem. And your business uh, perhaps uh, is not scaling uh, the way that it should. And have we thought about doing these things? I mean, I've got no perfect formula. And I would argue that none of us do. um, But you know, that you have to have those very sincere conversations about what your lifestyle looks like and what your tolerance level is going to be, right? Right. A 20 year old founder is going to look very different than a 50 year old founder. Um, And, and those tolerances are are very sincere and direct. And, um, you know, I like to to talk about Shark Tank, you know, every now and again, I see a, a founder on there. And, you know, they're like, well, I've I've spent all this and my whole life savings is gone and now I'm here and this is my last stance. And I'm thinking, well, how much customer discovery did you do? Who had a real conversation with you? And why are you here on your very last dime? Like, obviously, people aren't buying it. And that is a, a bigger problem. So um, so I think I about the watch. horse that's whisperer, right? That's why I cannot watch that show. I, I, I know. Failed, like- Season one and a half, I was out. I couldn't do it. It was too emo- It was too emotional for me. <laughs> it hurts my heart. Yeah, it it does. does. It hurts my heart in a lot Everybody of ways. Non, like the non-entrepreneur friends of mine, they love it. It's pure entertainment for them. Oh but yeah, for you, yeah. For you and people like you and I that 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 done that have been through this pain and struggle and, and helped so many others, it's it's impossible yeah. for us to watch that show. <laughs> it, it's so hard. And then I see the investors really, you know, put the term sheet, and it makes me like chatter. So it's, <laughs> you know, it really hurts my heart sometimes. But yeah. you know. But that's how they move to the next level. And, you know, you kind of learn along the way. And so when I really think about me calling myself the business whisperer, I'm not the only one. I mean, there's a gazillion business whisperers that actually do great things out there. It's just really stepping in the reality of what this means to your life to be a founder. And how much more tolerance can you pave on your roadmap? And, you know, what is going to make you achieve six months, 12 months and 18 months and really getting a, a consensus of, of you know how to accelerate or deaccelerate that right so we're kind of in an interesting time now where we see a lot of deacceleration 
uh, in certain industries and just massive acceleration in others. And so, you know, it, you're placing a bet um, yeah. in a lot of different ways, ways on, on fundamentals. So, so that's kind of what I mean. It's, it's a catchy, you know, term to yeah. really talk about those facets of business that people are scared to talk about. And, well, I and I would about, even apply that to the corporate, you know, in my corporate absolutely. roles as well. Mm -hmm. When I think about business whisper and I, and I know, and knowing you personally, um, it, it fits for me because, um, you, you kind of, <laughs> pardon my expression on this, you know, you speak softly and you carry a big stick, meaning like you, 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 you know what I mean? That's what a whisper does. I mean, what I mean by the big stick is you're, you've got yeah. like, you've got like the real deal message, right? You, you see, you see the problem pretty quickly. You've got a tough love message that you're ready to deliver if they want to hear it. But, but you, but you, you know, you don't have to, um, you, 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 you don't have to yell, you don't have to be abrasive or uh, aggressive about mm -hmm. it. You're very, you're very, you do it with, with nurture and with care. Like here, I have to tell you something because I care. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. Right? And, and usually that comes from a place of I've already done this yeah. and I've made this mistake. So let me, let me try to catalyze that for you and help you understand why it's so detrimental, right. To yeah, not just you personally, but you professionally and to me the whisper the other part i like about that word is it, it implies that you that you that you have a relationship with that person and that you have a great amount of care for them and you're you're whispering to them because i mean hey using some fun words here you would you don't want to embarrass mm -hmm. them per se you want them to kind of hey i care about you i need to tell you something and then you need to go fix it and you know without us having to like you know make a big thing of this you know you have a chance to um and that would that's what everybody would want from a friend Right. Yeah. That's what I would want yeah. from a friend or right from a family, somebody that cared about you to go, hey, pull mm -hmm. you aside and go, I need to tell you. Right. Yeah. That's what I think Absolutely. about when I see the whisper, when I hear the whisper that to me, that's a positive. Like I would want that in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and someone's got to tell you the truth. Yeah. I leave it to my mom to, to kind of serve up humility to me every now and again. You know. Oh, wow. Did you just throw me a segue? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, because I know you like talking about, about my life. Yeah, yeah, that was, that's where we were going next, right? That's where we were going next. So uh, when I was, you know, interviewing you before and you came to my class and all this stuff, we, like uh, your mom kept popping up as like this amazing person um, that I need you to, to talk about because this was a big start to your life. Um, and mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, you know, from, you know, having her own land development business and then being a single mom. And then that was seemed like so much of that must have shaped you. So if you don't mind, just pick up that a little bit. Yeah, um, I can kind of break that in, in two parts. So I had two people in my life, my grandmother and my mother that were uh, really essential drivers to to, I guess, my personality that I developed this competitive, you know, tenacious um, example, caring, you know, empathetic leader. Um, all, I, I do check the box on all those things because right. as you said earlier, I don't deliver the message unless I truly care, um, yeah. and have a I heartfelt kind of way. I yeah. I <laughs> yeah. I, um, my grandmother was probably, you know, one of the earliest, it was very, very early female entrepreneurs here in the, um, Atlanta area. She was a land developer. She was a developer. Uh, she also owned a um, construction company. Um, they did real estate investing. Um, they did a lot of different things. And so My grandmother was a boss. Let's just say it like she that. and she <laughs> was. I mean, there was just kind of this no nonsense, you know, take. I mean, and, and here's why. My grandmother, you know, had, you know, four children. My grandfather uh, worked for General Motors she was a stay-at-home mom. I mean, you can imagine the dimension, you know, the generation. Um, always worked for in finance. Uh, she worked for a, a bank and then uh, did, you know, all kinds of different things in banking part-time while the kids were at school. Um, and then she would tell me these amazing stories of like, you know, being uh, home with the kids and she would just be so exhausted because they were all like a year apart. She had twin boys then my mom, then my aunt. And so yeah. all four of them as young children trying to do business. And, you know, I guess at some point she cried uncle and was like, I'll just wait till they're teenagers and start a company. <laughs> right. But she would tell me these just grand stories of them taking uh, Nestle quick and mixing it when she was taking a nap and painting the walls. 
yeah. you know, just crazy stories. So my mom, my grandmother was very impressionable. She was an amazing storyteller. Um, and she was just all business. Uh, she didn't take no for an answer. She stood in a boardroom with men. Uh, she, I think she was the first female, if I recall, early seventies, that was, uh, even part of the Home Builders Association here uh, in, in the Georgia area. And so, you know, she had a lot of first. And I really never appreciated or thought about that probably until, you know, mid 2000s as I was exiting, um, you know, a, a company that I had built, a web development company, and really thinking, oh my gosh, well, this isn't the first time, you know, I've seen this. No wonder I'm doing these things. No wonder I. That's a question I, I have do it. Then. That's a question I have for you. Do you think she do you think your grandmother shaped your mom more uh, or you do you think your grandmother shaped you more or your mom more when it comes to your mother more when it comes to, say, business generally? Yeah, that's a great question. My mother was, uh, you know, a single mom. Uh, I have a sister that's seven years younger than I am. Um, we also went through some detrimental time. Um, my stepfather was old in a car accident when my mom was eight and a half months pregnant. So it was pretty much the three of us. Plus my grandparents played that huge instrumental part of kind of the making of, of us because my mom had to lean in, right? Um, she had to lean in and get support and have a life and, you know, try to do all these things. And uh, she worked in the legal profession. And so, you know, going to school and balancing things out is hard, right? So I, I think I get my tenacity <laughs> where yeah. I'm going here is yeah. my mom created this, probably this competitiveness, this tenacious, you know, not giving up um, aura around me. And my grandmother really crafted the business acumen, yeah. you know, the, yeah. you know, that this is how we do things and, you know, don't, you know, don't uh, always be ethical you know, take the right turn, um, you know, those kind of elements in business that um, probably my mom didn't have as much of because she always worked for someone. Wow. What a great combination. Um, uh, you know, how lucky are you to have, have those two, those two women as your, uh, Absolutely. your backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So let's pick it up with, uh, with you. And so I, I have, I have another little, little secret on you that well a lot some people know but this thing about the something around the uh the commodore right um the commodore 64. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so you so so you were i was asking you were you know you were a regular you know social kid and friends and, and different and you were in sports and all those things but you also had this uh little um uh little hobby at home with computers which is not would, would not you would not a lot of people would not expect yeah it's like you a Commodore talk 64 about? at home, right? Wasn't it a Com Commodore 64? It was a it? Commodore 64. I begged and pleaded my mom yeah. to please purchase this Commodore 64 for me. I was, <laughs> you know, very young, at seven maybe. Yeah. Um, it was really our first kind of foray into personal computing, you know, this as is, it would, is, right? People, people need to know these are the computers that you plugged into your family television. Am I right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And like not with an airport like we do today. <laughs> not not with, you know, the airport that we use today. No, it no, was uh, it, I mean the family, I mean I yeah. to, like took over the family TV, you know, for yes. the, during the day or something. You get home from school. I remember for me, to get home from school, the family TV could be mine for maybe an hour or two before, you know, evening. That's exactly right. That's that's spot on. Um, you, it basically is a you know it was intended. My we only had experience with word processors, right? So me getting a computer was like, all right, what what fun war games can I create here? You know, <laughs> what what um, misalignment and debauchery can I do with this thing? And it was just a, a genuine interest um, for me, probably from day one, just the art of communicating through a computer um to you know in the computer it, it's not even through the computer because i wasn't communicating we didn't have email and social um right. at that time i mean this is you know kind of the, the late 80s early 90s so um so that really didn't spin up until what 94 or so um which opened so, a whole uh, new world so not just computers but you were also like into math and science so you know so as you moved into you know high school uh, were you kind of yeah. like of all your girlfriends, so to speak, were you 
were you the only one in your group of say girlfriend friends that you had that that was into computers math and science uh um in your high school middle school years no i don't think so i think i had an acumen that i didn't realize i didn't know i really never recognized that i was an intelligent you know girl i i didn't know if that was okay to be right i um but there was always kind of this natural aptitude with me learning about the universe or you know diving into physics or understanding certain math not all math i i oftentimes say i don't do the two plus two kind of finance it's the big formulas that i like the really you know the complicated in my brain that's more complicated um although some people would call that easier you know i was i always had this kind of um aptitude to to want to learn why einstein felt the way he did and who was his challenger right and and why that was a hypothesis you know and um you know early days of copernicus and you know just studying the scientists and elements and and things like that were just they were just interesting to me i yeah. you know i still am a am, am an avid you know learner of what's happening in the universe and especially right now, you know, how, how are viruses created, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so this, this is why you applied to Georgia tech university, right? Be- because, uh, you know, you, you felt like you had a, had a shot because your the math and science thing was something that you were, you had grown confident in at least through high school somehow. Right. So- I wouldn't say I was confident in it whatsoever. In fact, I often tell the story and it, it kind of gives you the, left and right brain theory of how I function somehow in this, in this big <laughs> brain of mine. Um, <laughs> and I use that comically, by the way. Um, yeah, of <laughs> uh, I just wanted to be a fashion designer. Honestly, I wanted to go to art school. I wanted to create textiles. And that's what I wanted to study at tech was textile engineering and create fibers and understand fibers. And you know, I wanted to be a girl, you know, I wanted to to do my hair and, you know, wear the, I wanted to be girly. Yeah. I just, but I had this aptitude. That's why I oftentimes say it's okay to, you know, it's okay to, to look great and still show up and be smart. You don't have yeah. to not wear your heels I mean, in the boardroom, you know? Double, I mean, that's the double threat. Why not? Take yeah. Of all of that. And, and so you, you're, so you, when you, so you got accepted into Georgia Tech and even when you, which, by the way, everybody listening knows how hard and impossible that is. Um, you might as well have gone to MIT. They're all like it's right there. Uh, what when you were you hoping you weren't looking immediately to do engineering when you when you you were OK, right? So Absolutely not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, I flipped around a lot. Um, I even spent, you know, summers uh, <clears throat> going to take transient classes uh, in, in other schools just to kind of figure it out. Um, I, I wasn't on a direct path to engineering by any means. I, like I said, I really enjoyed this kind of textile thing. And then I was like, this, this probably isn't where I should be. This is fibery kind of, you know, this is way yeah. too biological for my brain. Uh, there is a different type of science in that than what probably I'm, I'm better at. Um, then, you know, I decided through just, you know, working that I really felt like, um, cause I worked full time uh as well mostly full-time and um and you know i worked for a science company and thought okay well eco sciences look familiar and interesting to me so maybe i'll take that path and then there was you know kind of business and then at some point you know the school is telling you you've got a lot of stuff here you know it's time for you to move on you've got to make a decision and um and i had an opportunity uh through an internship to uh, work with a telecom company which really fostered the uh brought back the computer engineering i was doing lots of of hardware um you know and i mean running cables on the floor like you know putting networks together learning security i I was just learning and so that was kind of an easy pick for me to Georgia Tech, put her on the hard technical yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then there would be the comment, she's a girl, you know, yeah. because that was I was the only one. So um, which, you know, play to win, right? I played uh, to win. Me, Christy, we were talking, you were telling me that even when you were at tech, um, I'll, there were several, there were definitely a few classes, several that you were at one point you were at some classes, you were the only girl in the class. In some cases, mm-hmm. you know, obviously one of only a couple, at, but sometimes the only girl in the class, mm-hmm. right? And you even had some very just you know disturbing remarks made to you by the professor or and so forth about you know 
your expectation for you, right? Oh yeah, I think um, no fault of Georgia Tech, by the way. I should make sure I preface no, no, that. No. But you know, people. Professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That um, you know, and and I I talk about that a lot. Like you know, you have to learn to be resilient in in every kind of environment you're in, and you know, sometimes resilience is also exhausting. And I think. You know, what I was referring to is a particular lab um, where I was the only girl. And that, you know, that was often in electrical and computer engineering. You're often the, you know, one of few. Um, and yeah, it was a lab where I I, I couldn't get a lab partner. <laughs> and I asked for an assigned lab partner. Please help me because they've all buddied up. I have no one. And I was told pretty indirectly, like, well, you're a girl. So just figure it out on your own. You know, these guys are used to this stuff. And so I thought, well, that's not the answer or the solution. So, right. um, you know, as a scientist, how are we going to work through this? And so my learning uh, was a little bit hampered. I would say my ego was hurt more than anything, so, but you had to so work through it. To, welcome to your life journey that, that officially yeah. kicked off in yeah. that moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The rest of the rest of your life, you would be dealing with this uh, kind of gender bias, uh, gender challenge, and um, and uh, and it didn't. I'm sure, and to this day, and that's why you dedicate mm -hmm. your work now so much to 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 women and women founders and women business owners because they've all kind of got a similar story at some level. I'm sure that it goes back yeah. this way, right? Um, yeah. So I want to um, I want to hop if you don't mind. I want to hop through. Um, you know, coming out of uh, Georgia Tech and and um, and then kind of, uh, you know, your first uh, your first job and 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 maybe and we can move to this fairly quickly if mm -hmm. you want, because, you know, tell it how you want to tell it, um, because we ultimately want to we want to get into some of these amazing little companies mm -hmm. you built and, and we're yeah. able to sell. But let's talk about, you know, World MCI WorldCom and where, and where that led you. I could. Yeah, I um, I went into a summer internship with MCI Worldcom and uh, did network engineering, which I was referring to yeah. earlier, which big evolved, evolved, company. evolved. Big, big huge big company. company. Yeah. yeah, huge telecom company. This was like 90, um, 98, 99. Huge company. Uh, it started as MCI. Worldcom acquired it. And what what for the audience, you know, for, for this, all intents and purposes, what I learned from that is how to be the largest bankruptcy in history um, and what fraud meant. <laughs> so, so you, um, I, I learned a lot about, uh, reporting and, um, you know, financial reporting and how, how things uh, were being fraudulently, um, done. And so, you know, that was a big life's lesson. It was a big learning lesson. It was also a big corporate lesson. And it also, um, you know, kind of put a black eye on, um, what, you know how, how we should be manning the manning the fort on these these uh, M and A's that happen, these large corporate M and A's to to some extent, right? Oversight has to be there. You can't have the same auditor that also does your technology systems and your finances, and you know, and and so that was uh, that was just a great learning experience for me, and I share that oftentimes. It's it's interesting to say and cite that you were part of the largest bankruptcy in history, <laughs> <laughs> well, or the largest fraud, you know. It's so funny. Uh, we one of the biggest exits. My one of my strong, one of my f best mentors um, uh, in the company that I spent a lot of time here in the Tampa Bay area sold for a really big number recently, and they were it was founded by Arthur Anderson, uh, Arthur yeah. Anderson folks. Another one of those big epic, you know, um, mm -hmm. implosions. And so some of the best, some of the best talent I know have come out of those kind of uh, epic implosion type of environments. Um, yeah. And so even the financial uh, debacle we had, you know, almost 10 years ago, I've known several people that that went on to do good things, do, do great things from that. In, in a way, it, yeah. un it unlocked and unleashed some really great talent, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I think and so there there was a lot there. Now, you let's get to this first company that you um, mm -hmm. that you started because it comes up to talk about how that came to be. Yeah, I um, I was just kind of accidentally you'll hear me say accidental a lot because yeah. everything that I feel like I've benefited from yeah. has been a, a bit of an accident, but also an intent. Um, I started a web development company, you know, that um, kind of soared and did really well. We had some digital marketing expertise, web development. Um, we were doing um, really heavy client focus in the age of, of 
new e-commerce. So we're thinking the one where you had everything scattered on the on the living room floor, you said, you know, that... every company I start, I have stuff all over the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I just happen to have two dogs next to me on the okay. floor today. But typically there's something all over the floor where I've got it. That's my creative space for some right. reason. Invoices over <laughs> here. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because when you're a founder, listen, there's yeah. no shame in that game. You're doing stuff all by yourself initially because you can't afford the staff nor should you you know really overextend to afford the staff until you're ready and so it takes a little a little extra umph to uh to scatter those invoices on the floor that's great but the first company was was really um in and around e-commerce and really digitizing people's businesses whether it was a mid-market consultancy or a you know or a large d2c brand um we were really in kind of co-creating their web presence in addition to community, you know, their voice of the client communication um, and all, all sorts of ways to stand their business up in the, in the web environment versus, you know, the previous 10 years, which were just really kind of, what is a website? How, uh, when you started, like, what did you have to start with? How did, what did you have to, to start that first one? Um, you know, two part question, mm -hmm. you know, how much kind of, cushion money did you have per se and then also any, any starting clients like how much how much did you yeah. have to work with to begin on the very first one i had one starting client that was billable uh, i had inked a letter of intent with that particular client that i knew could uh we would have deliverables uh I, if i recall correctly we had deliverables every 30 days and so we would have a net 15 on top of that so essentially i knew that i would have income you know kind of every 45 days um, and you know, it was, it was started with little to no money, um, you know, on the ground and that's, you know, that's not anyone's preference, but it, look, I was, you know, in my twenties building a company and I didn't have massive expectations, nor did I have really, you know, uh, an accelerator or incubator at that time that I could plant myself right. in and learn how to be a, how to be an entrepreneur or how to be a startup and how I should behave around any of those things. Um, we didn't have, you know, fancy OKRs and, you know, we, we didn't have all of those things in the, in 2000 and, and two and three. No. So, so those are, um, so I had to have a client and I knew I just kind of in my mind was I had to have revenue and I was very much the biz does biz dev focus with, um, you know, with the strategy and vision. And so, um, I had a, a couple of partners that did the, uh, creative and, and tease that out and what inevitably, I did was exit um, that particular company to my partner um, so that we could move that geographically. And that was a, a great, comfortable exit for me. So that's a good right. segue to then yes. what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, did yeah. you lead on the sales side of things too? Because that's usually where the entrepreneur founder has to go. They got to go out and yeah. get that business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, uh, I have no shortage of hustle muscle. And I, oftentimes, you know, I'm out always meeting with with clients or, or now you know sponsors or uh, yeah. board members or things like that where i can get out of the building as a, that's exactly right yeah was it uh jeff blank mm -hmm. at the, uh, yeah Piffin? yeah he talks about yeah. getting out of the building get out of the building yeah <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so that was that was very much so that the was role your first I played. exit so when you dig that you got a little a little bit of a you know a little bit of a cash uh, mm -hmm. situation from that from that exit and then what did you do right, right away right away um so we didn't talk about it but i was a competitive uh triathlete and so this gave me kind of the autonomy to separate out of the exhausting previous you know kind of you know eight or ten years that i had had through the bankruptcy of mci through the building of the company through all these things and I uh, took a year off and I trained and did um, several Ironmen uh, around the world. Um, and I also uh, worked uh, part time a little bit at a like a little clothing boutique, because remember what I said, I yeah. really wanted to do was be a fashion designer. Yeah. Um, I made zero money. I just kind of worked there. But uh, it, yeah. but I really enjoyed it. I it put me you know back in front of how to experience customer experience. And I actually remember taking the store uh, manager, this is a great story. Uh, you know, this was like a, I think the store, uh, was like a $300 million store or something crazy in, in Atlanta. I called it a little boutique. It's, it's a big store. And I was doing their personal shopping, like, 
you know, 10 hours a week or something. And I remember taking her a formidable business plan and saying, here's what you should do with this division. Here's how you could grow it and make money. And them looking at me like, you know, what yeah. we don't, yeah. we don't operate like that. You're just a salesperson. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, okay, well, this is fun and probably not enough for me, but I've had fun doing it for a few months. <laughs> you couldn't get that consultant out of you. And then no, I can't hold myself. Yeah. So, I can't help myself. Um, and you did. Yeah, the way you, I, I remember that you 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 went to Hawaii, yep. South Africa, yep. and, and yep. Uh, you know, Florida. Ironman. Too bad they're called Iron. Are they still called Iron Man? They, they women run them now. Are they? Yeah, they, but there's a whole branding, you know, around Iron Women. Is Iron Man gonna fix that? Evolve. <laughs> yeah, evolve. <laughs> right? I guess you, could, you know now is the time, Iron Man. Let's start you know. A petition. Let's start yeah. A petition. Right now. Yeah. Um, all right. So then, but then you, uh, you, you, of course, that wasn't going to last very long. And um, I think you were, you were recruited, you were recruited mm -hmm. into a, a company at that point, I believe, right? I was. Yeah. It was kind of my first foray. All these years, I had this culmination of kind of accidentally doing, um, you know, kind of staffing and recruiting. I literally would refer people over. I would end up, you know, they would end up accepting the job just because I had this kind of acumen for putting puzzles together of skill sets plus you know wherever they should fit and uh, a neighbor of mine owned a staffing company that I joined uh, very shortly and uh, it evolved actually into a um, national hire an executive recruiter called and they wanted uh, a large uh, global brand really wanted to hire someone to lead off um, out of Atlanta um, they saw the ecosystem in Atlanta as as we do today like it's a you know kind of a hub spoke for the Southeast and uh, they couldn't imagine why they didn't have any growth here. And so I took that on um, for four years and we scaled and grew and did, you know, multiple M and A's and uh, then I exited uh, and I comfortably. Think, think that, yeah. And I think mm -hmm. this is what I like about the story for people watching is this, this idea that, uh, you know, that um, it's not a bad thing to, uh, you know, have a, a job and, and build up a leadership and build up a skill set. Um, be, because a lot of times that can position you for your next move as an entrepreneur, right? A lot of, there's a, there's a, if you, you can, you can play those two things and you can kind of hate to say, but you can kind of get the best of both worlds going if you get the rhythm going just right. And you yeah. obviously did, yeah. but you had to, yeah. yeah, once you get it going, because, um, you know, you were able to kind of spin out of that, you, you know, you were able to learn that industry of staffing mm -hmm. and placement, right. And then you were able to go create your next company was in, was in that space, even, you know, yeah. uh, yeah, which is amazing, right? In a way, once you get that machine going, you you can start getting your entrepreneurial education on someone else's, you know, paycheck in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I had done great things for them. It was a very natural exit. Um, they were happy. I was happy, um, and I did. I built again out of my living room, uh, you know, on my living room floor with invoices everywhere. Uh, I started uh, <laughs> company, <laughs> yeah, company number three. And, um, and that was, you know, kind of evolved pretty quickly. And yeah. uh, I did start that one in um, kind of the tail end of 2007, early 2008. Uh, that should be kind of a, a placeholder because that was our last recession. And that one lasted, you know, it was not a, a V or, or, you know, a V-shaped curve. It was not quick and steady. It was very slow and agile. And, um, I, because I was in the hiring marketplace, I was a little bit fearful, but you know, what I had was a lot of clients that had a, you know, a massive need and, and we were very focused on, on fulfilling that with efficient, um, you know, mechanics around our recruiting process. And so that, um, really kind of set us apart from, from the, the traditional kind of staffing, uh, environment. And, and then someone came knocking again. Did you actively pursue the next, the next, per, the next company that, that acquired this one, or did they come knocking and find you? Both. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of both. Yeah. Both. Okay. You were, you were, mm -hmm. you guys were looking, but at the same time, you were someone. I needed to scale. Yeah. I needed to scale at a different level. I needed capital to scale. Uh, and this was a much larger, uh, you know, kind of opportunity to scale into, and so it made sense for the particular practice to be uh, kind of purchased and, and moved into um, into that company. And it was it was great, you know, super smart CEO, also female owned. Um, so it made sense for us to, to kind of unionize around that a bit. Right. 
in order so, to move faster, right? So when we talk about, you know, the blank method a lot, it's, you know, how do you move faster than everybody else? And so coming out of 2010, we had to identify how we're going to do that. Right. And so they acquired you and your team and so forth. And then you, you had an earn out period from there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you, mm -hmm. and, and then, uh, and, and then ultimately, um, and then finally, I know before we take a, a, yeah. a little bit of a turn break, you, 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 you ended up, you ended up at eight. Tell us how you ended up at ADP as a senior executive at ADP and everybody who's ADP is, See, this is again, you just, this way. You, yeah. You, the yeah. Way I was play, recruited in. It was, you know, your, your you know, I, I, need love, you to, I need you to put this in a playbook. Yeah. We need to yeah. teach people how to do this. Yeah. It's amazing because, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit um, really never goes away, but I was recruited, you know, in, to lead a, a certain part of, of a talent organization for ADP. And they were uh, a great, you know, breeding ground for that. And uh, they were also one of my largest clients. So I knew them intimately and had known them for, you know, 10 or 12 years and felt very comfortable with what their needs were um, and thought, oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is the purse that I need, right? This is the pocketbook that I need to do all these great things that we want to do. And we did achieve a lot of them. I, I'm still very much in touch with uh, their leadership team and a uh, very positive support around that. Um, and, uh, you know, was recruited in to do a certain something and ended up doing five or 10 more other things. Um, and, you know, that was kind of the, ge the genesis and the and the exodus of it, really it was it was just right. kind of co-created and um you know by by vehicle of selling so wow yeah and, and so tell me how uh when and how you left adp yeah i um was only intended to be there four years and i stayed you know slightly over that because i was doing something uh, fun and creative to kind of grow the the global footprint um and i was already working on company two and three. Uh, sorry, the next, sorry, in the next series, I guess that would be Here company four, four and again. five. Play, yeah, company play. four and five. Um, I really wanted to get back into um, kind of this, this product that had been sitting on my shoulders for a while. So I was doing some customer discovery around that. Um, and then, you know, just another um, kind of venture arm piece that I was working on as well through angel investing. And so, you know, those, those were at the kind of my beachhead of, of movement and uh, had a very great conversation with the, the president over at ADP. And she was super supportive of your board. I know your board, you tell me your board. Um, and she used a, a word that I still sticks with me. And in fact, I might text her after this, say I used you today. Um, Cause we're great Peloton friends. We watch each other on Peloton. Um, but she said, you do everything with integrity, even like leaving these these big corporate roles like you're you're just you know doing it with integrity and i thought well you might think that but you know i'm super nervous that i'm about to dive off a cliff again right i want to go invest in this and lead this and do all these things and um and so that was kind of the bug and but it was my my foray into venture capital not just angel investing and really understanding how the market um was was glowing um, through venture and, you know, what was happening in the startup ecosystem, I felt like I had a, um, you know, about an eight or nine month uh, education crash course on all of that. And uh, that was just pure departing, you know, on the right terms. Unbelievable. Um, so what I want to do is uh, we're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and talk about how you parlayed all of this into becoming an investor. So we're back in. And so when you left when you were going to leave ADP, you had, uh, did you have startup business ideas or do you have investment ideas that you were going to go with? Both. Um, okay. I genuinely had both. I was, uh, leading a startup. Uh, you know, we were in the throes of that. There were three of us that were really focused on it. And then, um, I also was looking for kind of some, uh, looking into more of the investment model outside of angel um, where I could learn a bit more. <clears throat> and a lot of that was out of a little bit of desperation, I would say, because I wanted to understand venture capital for my own um, kind of relief, even though I had raised in the past, I, it yeah. had, you know, I wanted to understand what was happening um, the on the other side. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. And yeah. I would imagine mentorship was probably back there too. At this point, I mean, it's your career where we're at in this point of career. You, you have a lot that you um, yeah. are able to kind of give back at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mean me mentoring others? Yeah. Like yeah. you want to invest, but you probably also just wanted to be around entrepreneurs and help yeah. them. And I'm imagining that's a big part of it. Yeah. And I really found, you know, kind of grounding in that when I was within um, ADP and part of that when I was selling um, my previous company was I was very involved in WBE and C the women's business enterprise national council. Um, we were a certified woman owned company. I had already, you know, kind of figured out that women needed support um, right. and not just, you know, women, but, you know, founders need support as well, but women need it most. And so um, you know, there's a balancing act that goes on and, and it's, it's a very interesting kind of dichotomy to watch. But, um, but even at, at, within ADP, I found this gap of support for women. Um, you know, some of us were tapped on the shoulders and, you know, it provided the, the extra conditioning and knowledge and learning others. You know, there definitely is a broken run problem in corporate America for women. And then you slice that even further and you've got women of color and it's it's even grossly underserved. Um, and so, you know, I did I did, you know, over the past 10 years that really kind of resonated on my soul a little more and more each day. And it, certainly it's now in my face, you know, hourly. So yeah. um, so that is a passion point for me is really elevating founders that need to um, understand their business. And so, you know, that kind of you know, hopefully I'm going back to where I started with yeah. your question, but it's, it, mm -hmm. it's definitely that, that marketplace I'm trying to, to lean into. Absolutely. I never heard that term before broken rung. I, I think that really paint the right picture of broken rung on the mm -hmm. ladder. I think that's a, a just a great visual. Um, but you, and, and do you mind if I just kind of go right onto that topic? Um, because I think it's a great little place for us to go because this is your mission in life and, and your, and your firsthand experience. And, and we all, what, how you know which? Uh, how would you describe the 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 woman business person, female entrepreneur, or just business person? Let's just keep it on the entrepreneurial side for a moment. But just generally speaking, what's the um, how do you describe the problem? And then and then uh, what what needs to be done? And, and and just what are your thoughts? Yeah, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have to be careful. You know, first I would say today is a, you know, kind of a special day for, um, for people, you know, it's, it's Juneteenth, which is representative of some things that happened. Um, you know, the freedoms that were, that were provided, you know, almost 200 years ago. I mean, this is, this is a pretty celebratory day in Atlanta. I actually was just out at Piedmont park because I live on Piedmont park and there were the protests and I okay. really enjoy seeing this generation of, um, right not that I don't think I'm a young person, but of young people yeah. <laughs> out protesting um, to really carve out what we want to see the next 25 years look like. And as a female, you know, I go back to the early days of, you know, being the only one, still the only one in a lot of ways. And, you know, I don't make excuses for that. I'm not asking for support. I just think the level field should be a little more even. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we shouldn't overlook skill sets because of uh, gender or non-gender or gender bias or uh, color or, um, you know, citizenship. I mean, we saw the Supreme Court rule on DACA yesterday, which was was thrilling from my perspective. Um, yeah. These are things that the U.S. represents. And if so, then why are we struggling so much in, a, you know, a part of history that's, you know, 300 years old? So, it's, you know, so for me, elevating women, especially the underserved founders, because it's not just women for me, I also work with underserved founders, men of color, um, you know, and that that I really get a kick off. Um, I'm super proud of all their companies. And, and sometimes it's comical. I just want to, can I do a shout out to one? Um, yeah, of course. Okay. I mentored one that I'm super proud of. And I'll tell the guys, actually, it's it's the CEO's birthday today. And I just sent him a text. Oh, wow. um, yeah, there's a company called Healthy Hip Hop that I'm super excited about that I mentored through Techstars. And uh, 
And this is a learning platform for children taught, you know, and secure platform for kids that has really gained steam in, in this environment um, of being at home and working from home. And so you think about, well, how does she represent hip hop? You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I love it. And I love to run to it and work out to it. Yeah. But, but what I would say to that is, but I've got this business acumen and this like undying, you know, this, you know, dying need to grow this company that doesn't go away. And so I'm constantly right. touching points with them to say, have you done this? Have you done this? Like you're able to lend you know, your, you're able to lend your, yeah. And your, yeah. um, you're able to lend uh, this stuff into that opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, right. Like that, that's yeah. what we, that's what you're doing. And that's what we do for women. Um, yeah. Uh, founders of color, just uh, that's kind of what, any, any of uh, anybody that has managed to gain a level of success or opportunity should should understand that if they don't find ways to contribute it back, then they're yeah. just um, they're not um, they're not propagating the, the the vision for for the country and for entrepreneurship, et cetera. Right? If you're just kind of holding yeah, on and to society it, you're never grows. So you're being a little bit yeah. you're being selfish if, if we aren't sharing. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so I love calling out to things like that. And, you know, you already said I'm an advisor for Tone Networks, which is a female focused uh, technology platform that uh, really sells to the enterprise that is focused 100% on solving the broken rung problem. Um, it really targets uh, females and organizations who may not have the executive coach because, you know, if you've got 50,000 employees, 25,000 are women. You can probably only take, you know, a hundred and give them an executive coach. So how do we solve for that? So there's, you know, utilities in that platform that that um, you know, their CEO Gemma is, you know, just ironclad uh set on solving that problem with. And so, yeah, so that's important to me. And so now at this point in my life, I'm not looking, I am looking for exits. I would be crazy not to, but you know, what is, what does that feel like? And how do I help those founders get to um, their exits? And so, right. you know, if I, if I really kind of leaned into that and talked about Launchpad 2X, what was the, the attraction to that for me coming out of venture capital, out of a venture capital firm that I just accidentally walked into because they were early investors in something I was working on, um, that taught me investments, that taught me how to solve problems that, you know, that for two years, that taught me, you know, how to edge through um, what made sense in investments. But but I did find that we passed on so many things because, you know, we weren't early enough uh, in, in the process. And so I, I needed to have that bleeding edge passion for these, these underserved founders that needed early money. And that yeah. is, you know, that is that more important real, to me. That must have been a real challenge. I always wonder about that for like, I know the, the last fund that you were working with, uh, they were early, but they didn't want to be too early. And you were out there mm -hmm. having to, um, and, and you were been, you were literally be in situations where you would absolutely love the company, love the founder and would absolutely want to invest a thousand percent. But you, you, your the, the fund that you were working with just wouldn't do that because it was too early. But that, yeah. but being okay, that's where risk is, of course, early. But that's also where the, that's the essence of of the of the startup and the entrepreneurship, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's 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 the part of it. Yeah, that's yeah. the part of it. And it's tough to be, you know, so now you're moving. So now you're moving yourself further. You you're moving everything earlier in your in your work that you're doing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I I think that's a hundred percent accurate. Yes right. and no. I mean there. You know, a lot of the companies that I have the delight to interact with are well into their series B raising stage. And, you know, they've been alumni of, of Launchpad 2X. So just by, you know, by association, I get to, you know, interact with them. But those those are not the ones that need me. The, the one or, you know, they, they have the confidence to continue to elevate what we're what we're leaning into are those early stage companies with some traction that uh, really do need uh, this uh, kind of education and resources and footprint and advisorship and mentorship um, to help them, you know, not sit on the floor with all their invoices <laughs> and uh, do this all alone because there is, there is a network effect in, in all of this that we do for Launchpad 2X. If you don't mind me asking too, I, I, so a lot of the examples you gave were, were kind of structural advice and mentorship and help and input and, and advisorship and so forth. Um, 
you know, but, you know, something that I think also applies, to, you know, that I want you to maybe comment on is something in your profile around um, changing the intellectual and instinctual tendencies um, that women and you maybe even could say, you know, minority founders of different types might mm -hmm. have the same challenge, right? There's some psychological stuff that 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 women founders and probably minority founders also deal with more so than your average, uh, you know, yeah. white, white um, founder, white, right? white middle class person. Of course. So maybe you don't mind speaking about that for a few minutes. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, this is, you know, by the numbers, we, you know, 2.8% 2, 2 of venture capital last year was provided to women. Yeah. And then let's carve that out. So how many of those were women of color? It's less than 1%. Yeah. I mean, it, it yeah. is an embarrassing number. Right. Why we don't um, elevate them uh, at the table is not necessarily venture capital's fault, but they're yeah. certainly not seeking them out. And so um, those are some of the things that I've seen in the past two weeks really, really bubble up in venture capital. Um, we know this this occurs. Uh, we know it's it's not readily sought out. We know that there are many founders of color that uh, should be at the table, you know, presenting. And so, why, you know, why why are they not making right. that mark? Some of that is confidence. A lot of that is yeah. confidence. It is something that you know the founder of Launchpad Two X, Bernie Dixon, uh, shares often. It's why eight years ago that she made the decision to to start this program. Uh, was really solidified on you know, her being the president of um, Atlanta Tech Angels and seeing that no women were showing up to present ever. And so what she kind of felt and saw was they didn't have, it wasn't they didn't have the aptitude or the company or the skill set, they didn't have the confidence. And so uh, so a lot of that that you're referring to is is really baked in, you know, how do we develop yeah. that? Because you know, not every company is going to be something special or a unicorn, but my gosh, what if you have a 10 or 12% return on, you know, yeah. on that yeah. company, you know, and you're putting in, you know, early money. I think yeah. that is, that is significant and not to be ignored. Well, I don't have the study in front of me, but there's definitely a study out there uh, that I've seen a few times that just that, that, that uh, women founders have uh, uh, just the numbers have shown that they provide dramatically more R ROI than male founders. Their, their, their track record of women founders yeah. are, is, 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 uh, is clear, is very clear, right? Yeah. Um, and that needs to be propagated more in the venture capital community. And you said earlier, maybe it's not venture capital's fault, yeah. but I would, you know, I think you would agree with me that it is a lot of that. They need to, they need to, re they need to reform themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and of course yeah. you can't make people reform. Um, and, and I think the, I've got a personal theory, the best uh, approach is for more successful women to basically elbow their way into the uh, investment committees of, of funds. That's some of the stuff like you're doing, by the way, um, because you <laughs> kind of have to change it from the inside out and you got to kind of do it through. Um, I think the, our powerful, our women that get, there are powerful women that make it to the levels like you just have to um, muscle and elbow in because no one's going to, no one's going to, unfortunately, eventually it just seems to be a machine that doesn't open up otherwise. And so I want to, yeah, yeah. Just encourage. I just want to like cheer you on for that because I just don't think it gets. It doesn't get. <laughs> it doesn't get opened up. Otherwise, there's a there's a certain amount of momentum that just is built in, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, now I want to revert my earlier venture capital statement because it is their fault. It yeah, absolutely is their fault. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> let me get gritty about it. Like it is absolutely yeah. their fault. They should be, um, in other words, you shouldn't have to be muscling in. Like you shouldn't I just have said. to. Fighting you, yeah. they should be trying to find Christy Brown. We need Christy Brown on this selection committee, on this investment committee. We need all. Yeah, that's what should be happening. But they just don't. Why? You know, to your point, they're like, yeah. Why would I change if I don't have to? Well, okay. Well, if that's the case, then I'm just going to have to force my way in. You <laughs> okay, got it. Good. And so, and and I see a lot of that culture in Atlanta. You know, I'm starting to see really, um, especially in the Black community, we know there's a deficit. I say yeah. we, I'm obviously, um, yeah. you know, kind of the ally out front, like really speaking to it. But uh, my great friend, uh, Shiloh, who started Zane Venture Fund, you know, works relentlessly um, to build this fund and this pre-capital program that just launched last week. And, you know, it's, you know, it's severely focused on, um, on the underserved. And so the uh, founders of color, that's it. That's the mission. And she did it. Why? Because no one else was doing this. 
And so it is venture capital's fault. We wouldn't be out here hustling to raise a fund. (laughs) But, uh, you know, ultimately, because ultimately, like anything else, um, you got to go fight for it. And I just uh, just love um, and it it makes, by the way, it'll make it taste sweeter when you have it. When you absolutely, absolutely great about it. Um, and then, yeah. but did, you're right. It's on both sides, right? So you got the on the you got the one yeah. side of the table where the money is, the money side of the table that, that problem we just talked about, and then the other one you touched on is on the on the founder side. You know, uh, confidence is one word. Um, you know, um, I talk about this a lot too. Like, you know, it's uh, you know, um, it's access, uh, confidence. Uh, but I don't like to use confidence too much because I feel like that almost implies that they have a, 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 a deficiency or a weakness. It's more about pulling when I work with founders, more like pulling their natural essence out, like letting their letting their true their true authentic self pulling that out of them so they don't have to come into that room and try to be somebody uh, they're not or try to because sometimes one of the reasons why we sometimes struggle with confidence is because we're we're thinking you, you know when you do pub for example when you do public speaking and you, you most people can relate with this when you over think it and you try to be something you're not and you get to in your own head, you, you get on that public speaking and you're kind of like flat and you don't come across strong. But yeah, uh, absolutely. Can coach you into like just being your truly trying to like be yourself. Um, and then it then confidence that natural confidence that we all carry around every day needs to come out on stage needs to come out in front of the investors. Yeah. Um, anyway, I just I just am obsessed about that topic, you know? Yeah. And we need to give space for that. You know, I oftentimes find myself, you know, people can say the darndest things, right? They, they can, I, you know, I've given so many um, public presentations. I always share up front, Hey, the first 30 seconds of this, I'm going to jitter jatter. It's just what I do. Right. I'm nervous. And then, then I flow into it and I'm super happy. Um, because you are, you're doing something that's out of your box, but we need to encourage that space so that people will stand up and, and speak and present and show their stuff. Be authentic, um, but, yeah. yeah, be authentic. And, um, and I think oftentimes I've had it happen to me before I've gone on stage in front of, you know, 800 people or what have you, you know, people will um, oftentimes say, oh my gosh, you know, I saw you practice last night. It was a little humdrum. Are you going to do something different or you know, why do you say that to people? Just give them the space to go present. You know, you right. want this to be a superstar. You know, not everybody yeah. is, you know, um, Marcus yeah, Buckingham on stage. Yeah, investors are ultimately investing in uh, yeah. that person and what they represent. So if they can't, so if we can't pull the, the real authentic person forward, um, then they're, they're not going to uh, be able to get that traction. And, and I, I just yeah. love when I see, even on Shark Tank, when I sometimes flip around and then again, mm-hmm. I avoid the show. But it's um, when when you can tell when somebody of any color of any type or stripe when they're just owning their their authentic self of, and yeah and you can see absolutely the, the investors react like it, it 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 you know you can tell the difference and they they want to be a part of that person because that yeah. person is just so authentic and I don't even want to use the word confidence they're like authentic like hey I. I don't know what she's got going. I don't know what she has, but I want to be a part of it, you know, because she's just mm-hmm. carrying herself, right? Absolutely. That's powerful with the early stage, especially the angel investing rounds and that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. right? And good energy. Yeah. yeah. It's the good energy. Yeah. Anything. So, Christy, I want to wrap us up here. And um, it's such an honor to talk to you. And I love this this topic. I love what you're doing. Um, and I'm so proud to know you and, and I love love all of everything about it. So is there anything um, that comes to mind that you want to say before we kind of wrap up anything you want to put out there? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, last, you know, kind of last comments when I think about it, you know, it's people used to ask me or still do, you know, as an endurance athlete, Oh my gosh, you've done Ironman, you've done marathons. And I think anybody can do this. Mm-hmm. Any anyone can. And I, I think of entrepreneurship so much in that way. I mean, you know, more than 90 percent of the, the U.S. business is made up of small businesses. Right. We can't let them fail, but we also have to be creative and encourage generationally that we continue to build yeah. um, and build ideas and encourage that. And um, and so I, I think about entrepreneurship so much like, you know, competitive triathlon right it's anybody can do this you've got to surround yourself with the right people and i just feel so um excited you know for things like tampa bay wave 
where there are accelerators that can help you. There are resources in every city. Everyone wants this type of economic development in their community. Um, and there are, are so many people like me and you, Alan, that are out there really kind of being the cheerleader. And, you know, if it's my life's mission, it, maybe it, take me, it took me a while to get to it, but it's certainly my life's purpose to um, elevate these companies. You know, I'm not looking for an output of it. I just, it feels really great to watch them grow and, right. and just be dynamos in their space. Yeah, and have some small piece, and and I and I think the endurance thing, is, racing, is a great analogy to you know end with with entrepreneurship and startups and entrepreneurship in general. General, like it's it is an endurance race, and just like an endurance mm -hmm. race, to your point, almost in, you, not everybody can train to be a great 100 you know meter sprinter or a 50 yard. Like, not <laughs> yeah. everyone can train to be a great sprinter because there's a lot of natural, yeah. obviously, talent there. But almost anybody can train themselves for an endurance race if they really yeah. really want to and, and compete and be and be good at it, right? And that's kind of what your point is about uh, entrepreneurship, isn't it? You can, yeah, a hundred percent. You can, you can be, you can, you can commit and train yourself to it to be successful. And, and by the way, it is going to be, and it is going to be a long, a long race. And it's a long race. Yeah, there's nothing short and sweet about it. I mean, I, Pace yourself. gosh, even the guys at Google and Uber would tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there's no, there's no quick three month turnaround in most of these right. businesses. So barely. Even three years is is pretty yeah. fast. Blink of the eye, isn't absolutely. It? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that well, would be my, Steve, you know, kind of my parting thoughts. And thanks yeah, for that asking that. I think that was a great way to end this. And uh, thank you so much on this, this Friday. Very, like you said, it's a, a very special holiday. Um, and um, and I can't wait to, uh, you know, um, chat with you like we do every so often and get caught yeah. up. And thank you for doing what you do. And I uh, look forward to you being back down in Tampa Bay soon too. So. Yeah. Yeah, Next week? Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got a ways <laughs> with this whole situation we're in, but uh, I, don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't even know what Tampa Bay looks like anymore. I, all I know is what my house looks like. Me too. <laughs> Me too. I forgot what city I live in. I don't know. It's, it's really strange, but um, you have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. And thank you. Thank so you. Much. And be well. Thank you guys. Take care. Be bye -bye. well.